and welcome back to Beating a Dead Horse. As always, I'm your host, Sean McKinda. And I'm your host, Jackson Keller. And this week, we are pretty much like everyone else in the world, discussing Avengers 3, Infinity War. Um, we did have a whole big theories last week, and I'm really excited to talk about them. And I don't want to say why, because that is a big spoiler in and it of itself. So this is the kind of movie where it's pretty much worthless to talk about it without spoilers. Um, but we're going to briefly do so anyway. So, Sean, quick thoughts. Um, I really enjoyed it. I don't think it was a perfect film. I don't think it's a film that's really going to stand out beyond being in the superhero genre like i think it was a solid superhero movie one that i definitely enjoyed i definitely liked it better than the first two avengers which i thought were both kind of lame um but i it's it's a solid movie if you like the superhero genre as of right now you're you're gonna like it like there's nothing in it that you really wouldn't like um it's got humor it's got some heart to it it's got uh, a talking raccoon, which that's not a spoiler. Everyone knows he's got a talking raccoon. Um, yeah, I don't know. I liked it well enough. Uh, is it probably the best Avengers movie so far? Well, uh, so I made a few different statements on Twitter, I believe. Uh, I know that when oh, I watched We all out liked of- watching your statements because I was talking to people like on, over Discord as you were making them, and we were like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Yeah, so I made I made a few statements that I'm go I'm going to walk back on a little bit. Not all of them. I still hate the Guardians of the Galaxy, but um, I said on Twitter that I thought, thinking more about it, it was a bottom tier MCU film. Uh, I'm going to retract that. I after talking about uh its merits both with Sean and kind of in kind of our pre-show discussion and a few other people. Um, it's definitely got enough craft talent to keep me from saying that like that, that feels pretty unfair. Um, I still don't think it was great. I would overall say that I wasn't much a fan. Um, and this is coming from someone who liked, the first Avengers especially very much, but also also even Age of Ultron. In fact, my my hottest take still is that I would probably rank Ultron over this. Um, what but, a weird fucking hell to die on. <laughs> you know, I, I don't th- I don't think Ultron gets enough credit, but that's 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 a, that's a hill to die on another day. Um, but uh, as far as like. <sighs> As far as the movie itself, I don't know. I guess I just overall didn't much like it. Not for any grand, like, thematic offense or for anything that was particularly bad about it. I guess I just didn't overall find it that funny. I thought some of the... the, Like, this isn't really much of a spoiler to say, but, like, one of the smart things the film does do is sort of pair off all the characters. So it does handle having so many characters well, but I thought some of the pairings that they made were a little weird and underwhelming, and I wasn't always a fan of the character interactions. Like, because that's sort of what people always come back to with these Marvel movies more broadly, but the Avengers movies more specifically, is that it's fun to just watch the characters kind of bounce off each other. And I didn't... I didn't think it was that fun in this one overall. There were a couple standouts. Um, So, yeah, a lot of just, like, surface level, like, eh, from me. But there there was some good stuff. I mean, I'm not going to tell you, like, not to see it because you already did. And you're already going to. Everyone's going to see it. So, who cares? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I don't disagree with most of the points that you bring up and will bring up. I just don't think that they had as detrimental as an impact as you did is really what it boils down to is I thought overall the characters might not have not all the characters played off each other perfectly but they played it off each other well enough that I liked it um I mean it is if nothing else a an incredible feat that they managed to take 10,000 characters make them all somewhat engaging and like cognitively aware of what they're doing and what they're supposed to be doing 
extended over two hours and 40 god dang minutes and not ever be overwhelmingly boring. Like, they're absolutely apart, and we're going to talk about one area in particular where I thought it was a little lackluster, but, like, at no point did I ever feel like, oh, I gotta check my watch. Let's see what's happening. I'm thinking about Hurricane Heist right now. <laughs> um, no, I mean, and I, I think the biggest compliment I could give the movie is that at, like, two hours, however many minutes, like, two hours, 40 minutes, um, it still didn't feel as long as a lot of the 90-minute movies that I've seen recently, so... Um, yeah, definitely kudos to that. That's not something that's easy to pull off. Uh, so the pacing was good, at least. <laughs> I mean, like, even barring the pacing, like, even if you have good, or, I mean, even if you have good pacing, you need to have content in it that to keep it moving forward and to keep it enjoyable. Like, if your pacing's good, but your movie sucks, you're still gonna get bored. Right. So, I, I, I think that that says a lot about it right there, especially because it is the culmination of 10 years and, I think, 17, 19 movies that work together in some bizarre fashion. Like, this is unprecedented in within the whole cinematic field, and the fact that it actually pulls it off well is crazy. Well, I shouldn't say this is unprecedented. We did have Justice League. <laughs> we did have Justice League, which combined a total of, uh, of three? Four movies, excuse me. Um, but, uh, you know, hashtag insert memes about the the greatest most ambitious crossover event in history here um wait wait are you including suicide squad in that combination i am including suicide squad in that combination i don't think dc includes suicide <laughs> squad in that combination <laughs> uh, well technically batfleck does appear in it so <laughs> oh yeah i guess he does <laughs> um mm. you know i i see i i can see your point that it, it's completely inconsequential uh, but, you know, you know, technically it does feature a Batman, so. And it features the Batman. So, I guess, I guess it is technically part of that canon. Uh, so I feel like that's, that's pretty much all we can say about this without spoilers. So, uh, let's, let's move into spoilers. Let's move into spoilers. Wait, do you want to talk about Suicide Squad some more first? Because, like, no. I feel like I could talk about Suicide Squad for a while. I have no. lots of thoughts. <laughs> Oh, all right. So yeah, let, let, let's 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 talk spoilers. Um, and I think before we really dive into deep spoilers, we need to talk about how we're going to be looking at this movie, because there are a number of ways that you can. Because there is the we're looking at just this movie as a standalone type of movie. Like there's nothing surrounding it. There's no previous movies, which I think we both agree that that would be really foolhardy to do because like this movie if you don't have the movies prior makes little consequential sense like all the characters are all based on sprawling movies that have already happened so to ignore those i think would not serve us well and i think would also be very very hard just because with the exception of thor ragnarok and jackson we've seen all of them Yes, uh, and that might also be uh, another big old compliment I can give the work done in this movie is that it did make me legitimately make me want to go back and watch Thor Ragnarok, whereas before it was just something I felt like I should do kind of out of obligation. Um, and uh, But no, I agree in that uh, it is impossible to divorce the Infinity War thing from the rest of the MCU, from the rest of the film climate even. But what I think we can do is that we can evaluate it still as a as a piece of that, if that makes sense, as as for how it what sort of goals it's it's going after, like what sort of themes it's trying to express uh and like how well it achieves those goals as part of like I, I think I think that even evaluating it as the culmination of a whole is still uh you can still approach it like any like any other piece of media the way you might uh take an episode of something like like just a TV show you can take an individual episode of a TV show and sort of evaluate um 
where the characters start off, like where it's leading them, and even within it, like what sort of uh, what sort of message or theme is being conveyed, what sort of development is happening. So, uh, I I mean, I guess I can't speak totally for you, but that's that's sort of where I'm coming from on this, like trying to evaluate it as as a complete episode of a show if that makes sense (laughs) yeah for sure um i think the big thing that we're trying to get across with how we're we want to look at this is there's uh clearly some future impacts that this movie is going to have um and while we're going to talk about those impacts especially because um one of us (laughs) me had a uh very good prediction last week um i think that that's it's important to talk about but i think that that's something that we should kind of divorce from and push to the end because there's a whole level of cynicism and conversation surrounding that that I feel like would not do this conversation any good as far as just like examining this movie as a whole. I think that's well said. Uh, However, I just want to like bow to the master for a minute since we are deep in spoiler territory. Just say, Sean... You were absolutely nearly 100% correct last week. So if you somehow haven't listened to last week's episode, I basically theorized that um, everyone's going to die in this movie. Uh, I said, you know, there's going to be a ragtag group that lives and everyone else is going to die. And unfortunately, I got the back half right and that everyone died. I guessed who was going to live wrong. I had assumed that part two was going to be this story of the ragtag group and, you know, the old superheroes, Captain America, Iron Man, all of them are going to see their success, step down and be like, all right, we're, we're moving the standard bearer over. Um, instead, what happened is that the new superheroes, quote unquote, died and we're getting uh, a last hurrah from the old guard, which makes honestly just as much sense. I just had it flipped. So, whoops. So we'll we'll talk more about the implications of that later, but I just I just wanted to take that moment, um, and and acknowledge the elephant in the room that yes I I couldn't have gotten it more wrong and you got it about as right as anyone probably could have. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, as I said we were really kind of hoping that we were going to be wrong on that one because it does open a lot of very cynical doors um and doors that as we said we will be talking about at the end um but that's for the end so let's let's go back to the beginning and talk about infinity war and the people who die in it and um i i want to open up with the weird kind of opening that it actually has because so just, just right off the bat, within like the first five minutes, Thanos straight up kills Loki, which is an effective death. It says a whole lot of tone and precedent for what we're going forward with the movie. You know, there's no loyalty to anyone. Anyone can die. Any, it's going to be remorseless. All that good stuff. Cool. Great. The weird part about it, and this is going to be very light spoilers for Ragnarok. I'm not really going to get into any plot details. More of a thematic element to it um, is... Ragnarok had a huge focus on, like, the redemption of Loki and him, you know, understanding family and kind of like, all right, I'm done being a douchebag. I'm going to I'm gonna stick with Thor for a little while now. And this movie basically goes, all right, well, that's great, but also fuck you. He's dead now. Ragnarok doesn't matter. Yeah, and, and so, you know, having not seen Ragnarok and going in, um to the immediately opening with the Thor stuff uh, it was was a little bit uh, I, I was kind of sweating a bit in the theater like oh shit like I should I should have taken the time to watch Thor um, the only the only reason I didn't is because the movie was already out by the time I would have had the chance to really sit down and catch up uh, but then I was too afraid of uh, coming across spoilers and I didn't want that to happen so I was just like eh hey, you know I'm sure that like the 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 core components will be uh recapped and uh i mean you know they, they weren't really uh thor and loki are uh, on a ship and uh thanos strangles loki to death and then it blows up <laughs> yeah and basically 
Uh, and just as we were discussing this, and like this is even bigger that like I didn't really talk about. Like it, nothing that happened. Ragnarok is really, really fucking good, and I wanted more of the Ragnarok shenanigans that we were given, and um, the fact that they immediately blow up the ship that uh, ha- it takes off at the end of Ragnarok, and I don't really want to say anything more than that because once again, spoilers, but. It really just undoes the entirety of Ragnarok. Like, nothing in Ragnarok matters anymore. It's still a really good movie, and go watch it, but if you've seen Infinity War at this point, you know that nothing in it matters. And like, <laughs> Nothing matters. We're all gonna die. Yeah, e- Which even, I guess is a kind of statement. <laughs> I guess so, but, like, that's a weird statement for a superhero movie to make in its opening minutes. Well... And so I think that um, it, it, having it in the opening minutes, uh, it is a weird sort of statement for um, a superhero movie to make. But I, but I, I think that if you are going to make that, because that's very much the uh, sort of running thread through this, is, is perhaps this idea, at least from the hero side, of like... Uh, all their effort coming out to nothing, like insurmountable odds. Which, I mean, I guess, I guess it sets the tone correctly, uh, if nothing else. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean for sure. It if you have seen Ragnarok, it does kind of be like, all right, well, the heroics are now a failure. Sorry, but at the same time, it is it, it's just kind of a weird undoing of Ragnarok, which is basically the immediate predecessor to this i know black panther came out in between um but i black panther has much less to do with infinity war than black than ragnarok does black panther was really self-contained by marvel movie standards yeah entirely so like ragnarok really leads into infinity war black panther just kind of exists and that's not nothing against black panther black panther was excellent but it it's weird that the opening scene basically undoes the entirety of Ragnarok. And, it, like, he loses his eye in Ragnarok and gets his eye back in this movie. So... I, I, I was given that moment of, like, some real side eye. I was like, hmm. Like, that seems like a like a meaningful consequence that this movie kind of undid. Uh, yeah, t- I mean, it, it was. It was a symbolic moment. And, like... If you're trying to make Chris Hemsworth look hot with both eyes, I really like the one eye patch look. <laughs> Welcome to the Chris cast, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Discussing uh, the hotness of the hottest Chris's in Hollywood. You know, you know, I'm, tr- I'm trying to think if there's been an instance in the MCU like this where a sequel has, like, undone sort of the themes or intent of the uh of a previous entry and i sort of realized that it kind of has because i remember that um there was a big stink uh over the ending of iron man 3 how like it's see it's supposed to be like this big moment of like growth and it looks kind of like it's an end to like the iron man story which of course then um we see in age of ultron that like it it didn't really have that much of a meaningful impact. Like he just went back to Iron Manning. Uh, so which I yeah, mean, a bigger problem of the MCU in general. To be perfectly honest, is like as much as they want these continuity filled universe to exist, they really seek to undo any sort of meaningful progress made in their individual movies as soon as we hit an Avengers movie. Like, Thor finally had a good movie in which character progress happened, all that good stuff. Iron Man had a great Iron Man 3 where it culminated in him being like, all right, I'm kind of done now. And immediately, immediately, we got an Avengers movie after that, and it just went, eh, just kidding. Don't worry about it. Yeah, and and so that's... um, Yeah, that's, that's, that's sort of weird because I'm trying to, like... In the solo movies, now that there's a lot more crossover between them, at the beginning, like in Phase 1, they were very much separated, uh, but there's a lot more back and forth between them now. Um, So I think it's... uh, I mean, I guess it's just natural, though, that the big crossovers are going to be the ones that, like, undo the consequences or ignore the consequences. 
it, it's just, it's a little frustrating at times. Like, even uh, Spider-Man Homecoming was undone by this movie. Because the whole thing was that he didn't want to be an Avenger yet. He wasn't ready. And then he's like, ah, no, nah, just kidding. I'm an Avenger now. Oh, my God. You're totally right. I didn't even think about that. Uh, yeah, like, all of it. They just... You know, they, they set up all these things and, like, all these character beats. They're just kind of like, eh, yeah, you know what? Don't worry about it. We'll deal with that later. It's, who fucking cares? This is this is the crossover event of the century, and we're going to make $300 billion opening weekend, smashing all box office records, blah, 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 blah. Who gives a shit about character development? Not us, says Marvel. Well... So, so character development. Uh, this is this is sort of jumping ahead a little bit, but while we're thinking about this, um, I sort of wanted to get into why I think the movie ultimately doesn't really work that well for me because I think there are three key reasons. Um, the first of it, which you I'm mean not like gonna... in Ready Player One. Oh, oh. So, uh, Jackson, Professor Jackson Halliday. Has has left his three keys in this in this cast to unlock the secrets of why he didn't like uh, Infinity War. So the first one I could just summarize because there's not that much to it, and that I just didn't find the character interactions all that charming. Uh, and you know that's completely a personal taste thing. But for me, I think it says a lot when you pair up Tony Stark, Doctor Strange, and Peter Quill for a significant portion of the movie. And highlight just how much of the MCU is the same snarky asshole. Uh, so I found that a little a little tiring, uh, and a lot of the jokes didn't land, especially coming from the Guardians. Like I like I I don't know what happened. I really liked Guardians one, um, but something about two and their role in this movie just really rubbed me the wrong way. Maybe, maybe just like feeling like it was the same kind of humor, but getting kind of uh, maybe getting fatigued with it. Um, that said, I do have to come to the defense because we did talk about this. Thor, Groot and Rocket were fucking excellent. Thor was the MVP of this movie by a landslide. Um, I, I'm just going to steal directly from film crit Hulk here because he, pretty much stole my thunder with the article that he just released about it that we linked to on our Twitter. Um, and where he mentions that the moment where Thor is like sort of lamenting and like really coming to terms with the fact that with Loki gone, he has now lost like everything. Like that was the most powerful moment of the movie. He gets the biggest, coolest action scene when he makes Stormbreaker, uh, both when he's wielding Stormbreaker and when he's making it, when he's taking on the force of that star in the most epic fashion possible. Um, and then he's just Kratos from God of War. And then and then he's just Kratos from God of War. And uh, but yeah, putting putting him with uh, uh, Groot and Rocket. A uh, good unexpected thing. Uh, I I got in there in the initial meeting. I got a little tired of Peter Quill's posturing. Um, and but I will say that like of the humor, the best joke for me that did land uh, was when was when Drax was like looking at his body and and he says to Quill like No no no, you're a dude. This this is a man. <laughs> and, and that one really killed at, at the showing, and for good reason. Um, that that's the kind of like that that felt more like it feels like a lot of the Drax jokes now. Uh, this is this is a good segue into kind of the character development problem because Drax used to be my favorite Guardian. Um, and in Guardians two in this movie, it felt like a lot of the Drax jokes were less kind of that weird like specific sort of like oblivious humor of like you know nothing goes over my head my reflexes are too fast i would catch it like that sort of thing gets replaced a lot with just drag sort of like laughing obnoxiously um and so i find myself in this weird position where as the guardians movies go on drag slowly becomes my least favorite member of the team and Gamora, who in the first film I thought was sort of a, a kind of sexist, like, cold, badass, like, stereotype, like, she's the buzzkill, like, oh, look at all these wacky boys having their fun, and then there's the one girl who's like, uh, rolling her eyes, like, I thought, kind of a tiresome trope, uh, and then in Guardians 2, she kind of has the whole subplot between her and Nebula that's a, a little more, that really landed with me, and I think that stuff 
ends up getting continued here with sort of her relationship to Thanos and her ultimate death. And I've seen a lot of uh, I, this this one, I think more than even the ending. I, I think Gamora's death I've seen has been stirring up a lot of controversy um, just for how much we're supposed to be sympathizing with Thanos in this given scene. Uh, and I understand where people are coming from thinking that it's, uh, or rather not thinking from that. That sounds like it's downplaying it, but interpreting it as, uh, like having the audience like sympathize and cry with Thanos, because that is what a lot of the audience ended up doing. Like I've seen, I've seen a lot of people talking about that. Um, but what I saw it more as was less that like, we're supposed to be sympathizing with Thanos for, um, making this choice and more as this being the ultimate expression of Thanos as kind of the abusive father that we saw sort of brought up as a concept in Guardians 2 where um you know we see this he he ends up having to sacrifice Gamora for the Red Skull which was the most what the fuck thing in the world um, never thought we would see the Red Skull again. Never cared to see the Red Skull again, to be honest. Um, yeah, that was more than a little buck wild. And I guess, like, just, like, all right, so really quick, just because I was really confused by why the Red Skull was there. He does technically get sucked up by the Tesseract at the end of, uh, Captain America, the first Avenger. So, like, I guess it tracks, like, in a weird continuity way but like it's fucking wild it's 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 technically correct the best kind of correct and like Um, crazy thing is i saw like i i talked about this last week i saw the first avenger a week and a half ago i don't remember that i was still like why the fuck is the red skull here I, I I actually had I actually questioned whether it was the Red Skull, even though it clearly was. I'm like, but wait, didn't he die? Like, what's going on? Um, so I thought maybe I, it was gonna be like a projection or something like that. Like, this is the way that the stone would like to be seen, and then it's like, nah, it's just actually the Red Skull. Yeah, and so I mean, I think that's just a testament to how effective the Red Skull was as a villain. <laughs> Um, uh, but, you know, all that aside is that in the, uh, sacrifice scene where Thanos, uh, gives up, you know, the only thing that he loves, you know, uh, to get the soul stone, um, that, that to me is the, again, the culmination of, like, painting Thanos as the abusive father, as someone who, um, is a monster, but in, in his own, like, heart like, thinks that he is, uh, that he is on his, like, noble quest, like, thinks that he is doing the correct thing, but it's just, uh, it's just all of his abuse taken to a logical extreme. So, so I get the, um, I get the complaint that we're fridging Gamora, um, but I, I guess, I guess for me, it, it, it tracks with kind of the abuse metaphor that was being built up in her storyline, I suppose. Yeah, the Gamora death scene, I, I can't really place why it didn't work for me as well as you can. Um, there was just something about it that felt odd to me. And I, I think it might honestly be that like there's a weird moment where you almost want to feel sympathy for Thanos. like Or like maybe not that you want to, but like you're almost expected to. And I, I think that's the I think that's the big problem that people are having that like with the way the tonally tonally the scene is being played that we are indeed supposed to find this a very sad moment as opposed to a very like fucked up moment I guess if that makes sense and like I wonder I, I I'd be hard pressed to assume that like. Uh, you know, I can't even say that because I was gonna say I'd be hard pressed to assume that this is like the Russo brothers actively being like, "Be sad for Thanos here." But I mean, I guess it, if you're trying to create a villain, like they're clearly trying to actually create a villain and not just another, you know, storm cloud to destroy the world, looking directly at you, Galactus. Um, maybe like this is some weird way that they're trying to personify him, but. 
it's just, it's so weird. And I was going to say, you know, maybe it's just like the way the shot construction works or whatever, like just the, the atmosphere of the, the scening is just off or whatever. And maybe it would work better with a slightly different cut, but I don't know that it would. It's just so, or like, I don't know that it was unintentional the way it was framed. It, it just, it's, it's, it's wild and uncomfortable and unpleasant. And I, I think it's because like, you're trying to, rationalize Thanos's decision and I just I can't get there like I, I guess I apologize because I am kind of wrestling with my own emotions and how this scene should be perceived because like it there's an argument to be made for well you're supposed to kind of wrestle with this feelings of guilt and sadness and whatnot but like why are you, is like, oh, okay, well, I guess I'm wrestling with the fact that I kind of agree with Space Hitler? Well, so I think that, um, I think that part of this is just based on, like, the previous scenes between Gamora and Thanos and sort of how they play out over the course of the, um, over the course of the movie, and I think it can fuel the reaction in like one of two ways so uh i remember you were saying that you had felt like that all of their stuff was sort of underdeveloped and i i had sort of taken it a little bit differently like because i had i i was I, I was thinking about the like whole abusive dad thing from guardians 2 and what i saw there was the the fact that their interactions were kind of token was something that that maybe felt like the point to me that um, Thanos is trying to be all fatherly, trying to um, get Gamora like back into her back into his life and like get him sort of under his control again. But it didn't really. Uh, but you know she's not having it. Like she sees through his bullshit this time, and so it's all very it's all very surface level. All his gestures are very token. Um, and so with the way that like I read the death scene, like that all tracks. But if you're, if we're under the assumption that the death scene is supposed to make us feel sorry for Thanos or sympathize with Thanos, then the fact that everything earlier was so underdeveloped only makes that coming to that scene more of like an awkward question mark, I guess. So I guess the question is then, if we're not supposed to feel for Thanos, like what would the goal of the scene be? To just be sad that Gamora died? I, I read it just as, um, not, not that we were supposed to be sad for Thanos, but to, to build, um, and, and I mean, I guess, uh, this, this is the other problem is that it is, it is a textbook case of fridging, no matter how you slice it. Um, particularly with how much emphasis is given to Peter Quill's reaction to her death later on. Uh, but the... The goal of the scene is to, I think, show us, like, exactly how, uh, like, by place, I guess by placing the context of, like, abusive fatherhood, it's to show us exactly, Thanos is exactly the monster that you think he is, um, willing, willing to do this, but it also shows, by show, having him show these emotions, that he really does believe that what he's doing is right, and that this is like the sacrifice, like that's that's supposed to be, um, and I, you know, I guess this is a good a good opportunity to jump into the broader discussion on Thanos in general because he is the main reason. Uh, it, it may seem a little weird because I'm sort of you know offering interpretations for this scene that maybe gives it more merit than it really has, but I think he is ultimately one of the reasons that um, the movie doesn't work that well for me, even though he's not a terrible villain like like a Mickey Rourke in Iron Man 2 or a, or like a Malekith or something like that. Who? Uh, <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, Malekith wants his bird from the dark world. And oh, oh, okay. Is that where they use the Tesseract? Uh, yes. They make him a new bird, but then Thor smashes it with Mjolnir, and then he's very sad. Mm. Uh, and that actually, that's that was the introduction of young Sheldon, correct? Yeah. <laughs> So the, because the bird was a phoenix, he was reborn as Thanos' third child, young Sheldon. Uh, so, um, 
back to Thanos. Um, we, we, were, we were kind of having a little debate over whether or not Thanos had a character in this movie. And I, I would say that he does. It's not a super interesting or super great character. I think it's a well-performed character. I think... Uh, that Josh Brolin gives a lot of gravitas to him in, like, power and this sort of, like, soft-spoken, like, understated element that he has. Um, But basically, like, he's just sort of this world-weary guy who thinks he's taken on, like, this grand heroic burden. And um, that's, I mean, that's basically all there is to him, but that's that is strictly speaking a character, uh, and my my problem with it is just that the motivation he has uh, to bring balance by wiping out the universe it's just a such a cliche, um, and one of my like personal pet peeves because when you nobody nobody thinks that way. Uh, like genesis like genocides in reality are not motivated by this nebulous concept of balance like it drives me nuts in like star wars too uh there's balance like morally it's it's not a thing uh and it's it's just weird that so many movies keep coming back to this idea of balance and it's just really trite really overplayed and um I don't think that despite how well acted he is and the fact that, like, he does have a character, which automatically puts him a step up from every other, like, pre-Phase 3 Marvel villain. Young um, Sheldon. <laughs> yeah. but I But I do think that uh, he... It just ends up being such a weak thing because it's so... It's so removed from any sort of reality and like because even with fantastical things like infinity stones you could still have something like even the most like grand like out there villain and i'm gonna be you know apologies for those of us joining us just because it's an avengers discussion but i'm gonna be referencing a bunch of fucking anime here because i think they're a great example so jojo's bizarre adventure we talked about that previously uh dio is like the biggest mustache twirler like about as like evil for evil's sake as you can get for a villain but those first few episodes do a really good job of making you understand why he does the what he does and why he thinks the way it is you can see it in like one shot like even uh and like pretty much you understand his character from then on out uh ditto with even more one-dimensional frieza from dragon ball z is basically space donald trump he wants to sell planets to make a profit and he wants to be the biggest boy in the galaxy, so he's gonna get the Dragon Balls to help cement his position as like the like real estate broker of everywhere. And um they're not super deep, but they're enough. Like those ideas, the idea of like not wanting to be, in Dio's case, like not wanting to be uh like trod on by everyone else, like ha- like seize control of your life. Uh, like, that's some, that's something that people feel, like, real people feel like, or even, like, you know, I'm Frieza, I want to have a bunch of money, I want to have a bunch of, like, stuff, uh, planets in this case, uh, instead of, like, buildings, but, like, there, there's a correlation there that tracks with, like, him being, again, like, space Donald Trump, uh, but with Thanos, when he starts talking about all this shit about balance to the point where he, like, sacrifices his daughter, you know, finger quotes daughter for it. Um, I mean, it's basically nonsense. <laughs> so I, I, I want to kind of present both a counter-argument and an agreement. So I think my counter-argument stems from the fact that I would argue that there's a large number of people who believe that there is a balance that can be struck within the universe. I believe that people like you and I who might see the universe as a more inherently chaotic place won't necessarily get this point of view. But I believe that there is a large number of people, um, and this is not, I am going to be 100% generalizing here, I apologize, but like I think that for the sake of argument, it makes sense. Um, but I believe people who are more religious, people who are more just kind of looking for some stability within the world, people who just want 
a reason for things to happen believe that there could be a balance struck. So I think that for us, yeah, a balance guy might not make sense just because I, I know at least in my personal belief system and I'm sure judging from what I've talked to you for four years at this point, we have a very similar understanding that the universe is inherently chaotic. Things happen for no explicable reason in our worldview. So I think that the balance argument could exist and could work better for other people and Thanos is just taking that argument to a logical extreme. So I, I don't necessarily think that the balance thing is unbelievable, but I believe it is overplayed for sure. And I think that Thanos as a character doesn't necessarily do anything new and interesting with it. Like, Dio is an entirely overplayed thing, like just, oh, I don't want to be downtrodden, I will rise up above my station. But he's played in such an over-the-top and batshit insane manner that I think his character really stands out and becomes something different. I don't think Thanos has anything that really elevates his station to something along the lines of Dio. So, I do entirely agree that I think Thanos' character is there. You have convinced me of that. But I think it's just underwhelming. Yeah, to totally agreed. And I think that um, you make a good point uh, about the kind of argument of the balance thing. Uh, so, let, let, let me refocus just a little bit because um, sort of the reason I focus so much on that is that other people have already provided... Um, well, because, like, if I hadn't addressed this, I, n I know that people would say it, is that, well, you know, it's not specifically just about this nebulous, like, balance like it is in Star Wars. It's uh, more specifically about, like, overpopulation and a lack of resources. But the, but the problem with that is that um, w that also doesn't really track with kind of the situation in reality. Because although, like, worries about a lack of resources are... Um, you know, something happens in reality. Obviously, like, people starve, people suffer. Uh, the problem isn't that there isn't enough food. The problem is that there are systems in place that mean not everyone can have food. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. For yes. sure. Like, if you take it in a far broad, like, the broad balance stroke, absolutely. Like, it, it, it logically could make sense for a number of people. But when you start to get down to the nitty-gritty, it immediately falls apart. Because, like, that was something that even I was thinking about. Like, okay, half the people are gone, but, like, the wealthy and powerful are still going to control a large, vast number of resources. It's not going to change anything. Like, so half of the 1% disappears. Half of the rest of the population disappears as well. The 1% is still the 1%. Like, right. it, it, it doesn't change anything. So, like, absolutely, I think that his plan is weird and flawed, but I... Arguably, that plays into who Thanos is. Like, as I mentioned last time, his name is, like, Thanat is stems from Thanatos, which is, uh, uh, like, self-defeat or something along those lines. I don't exactly remember what it is, but it's Freudian. Um, so, like, it, it kind of plays into that. Like, he's not a perfect individual. Um, right. Um, and I, I guess all this is just to say that, uh, like, I, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure you would agree being... Uh, a big fan of the original, like, Infinity Gauntlet storyline, but I would have much preferred to see the big screen version of Thanos wants to fuck death and impress her. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I want. I was going to talk about that next, actually. Because, like, this whole thing boils down to Thanos is fine. He's he's fine. He's fine. He's fine. He's, he's perfectly acceptable as, like, the big bad of a movie like this. I would track him, like, as probably the least good of all the phase three villains that I've seen at least. Um, but I, but he's, cer he's certainly better than like all the phase one and two stuff. Pretty much <laughs> counterpoint Dormammu. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, that's, I God, I keep forgetting about Dr. Strange. Okay. <laughs> never mind. <laughs> um, anyway, just to kind of talk about the way that they could have done Thanos. And just because God, do I love the infinity gauntlet? Um, Basically, to contextualize him with today, Thanos is a MRA incel in this in, in the original Infinity Gauntlet, which, if you are unfamiliar with, that's men's right activist and involuntary involuntarily celibate. So, 
the basic idea of it is that if you are unfamiliar with it, I'm so sorry. Yeah, you've just been You're introduced about to, to have a your dark, dark world. <laughs> um, but the basic idea of the comic is that he he wants to fuck Death. He, like, Death is a woman in this, and he has fallen in love with her. And he's like, "All right, let's bang, baby." And she's like, "No." Um, and so basically he strives to get the entirety of the Infinity Stones simply to impress her so that they can fuck. And he does. He does all this stuff and she goes, no. And it's basically him wrestling with the fact that he's done all this, but she still doesn't want him. And it's a wild story. Like, it's insane. And it's it's a very character-driven story of him being like, why won't you just sleep with me? I'm I'm a nice guy. I'm a nice guy. Look what I've done for you. I've killed half the universe. You're just friend zoning me, Death. Yeah, no, like that that is basically the plot of this of the comic is her just rejecting his advances continuously, which is not something that I've seen in a movie I think ever. Like at least not from, like, the perspective of he's clearly the bad guy type of thing. Like, you see that in romantic comedies all the time. And, you know, he ends up being the hero and blah, 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 blah. But in this case, he would literally be an all-powerful god who just wants to get some. <laughs> and that is wildly more interesting than some balance idea. Yeah, way, way more interesting, way less cliche, way more human. Uh... Like, we can identify... Oh, yeah, you want to humanize them, do that. I mean, like, not, not that it humanizes them into something, like, good, but, like, we can point to the humans who are like this. We, we have names for them. Uh, and, uh, I mean, it's it's way more identifiably human and, and even more fucked up than what we see with this, like, heavy-handed burden of balance. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Th- Thanos... Mickey Rourke wants his burden back. <laughs> I'm sorry. I want my burden. <laughs> God. All right. So, whiplash aside, um, yeah. So I, I guess just Thanos not being the most engaging villain, and the fact that I don't know if I would so much call him the protagonist of this. I've seen that that one thrown around a lot. Um, and I mean, it didn't feel like that all that much to me, but, uh, undoubtedly sort of the center of it, uh, the fact that, like, thematically, he wasn't all that interesting, and the motives weren't all that, uh, like, in-depth, just meant that, you know, the rest of the way had to be carried by the heroes, who are pretty far-flung, and, like, there's, uh, you know, they balance them pretty well her her balance but like they don't they don't really add up to much individually like i can't really point to like who's what the story is in terms of like the emotional appeal in terms of like character development because a lot of it's thor four i mean i mean yeah except except for thor i guess like thor gets some development thor like this is if i had to like right now just like off the top of my head who's the protagonist it's thor yeah, I, I mean, I, I would agree. I would agree with that. It, it's Thor 4. Yeah, and, and 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 the shame is just that, like, you know, he ends up not taking up all that much of the movie, like, in the grand scheme of things. So he's got the strongest story, but it, it still just feels kind of like a drop in the greater Infinity War bucket to me. Um, and that just sort of brings me to the last thing that I guess really cemented why it didn't really work for me. The The biggest reason for me that the whole movie didn't really work is the ending and not just because you called it and that not only did you call it, but it's even more blatant than I expected about the fact that the consequences aren't really consequences uh, because we see... You, you know this because we see Black Panther die, and uh, even even if you you don't know the whole Marvel Universe production schedule, you know that they're not going to you know, waste Black Panther 
when he just made them all the money in the universe. Uh, so it, that's just a moment where it's like, no way, like no way that anyone fading out right now doesn't come back. And you know, that that's getting into the whole discussion of whether it's fair to judge the movie um, like that. I mean, I think it's fair in one sense because it did just movies are kind of emotional things and it did temper my emotional reaction to the sequence. Um, but I think that's not all that's going on here. Because I did get a little emotional during this part, specifically with Spider-Man fading out of Tony's arms. I think that's the, the most effective death in the movie is uh, when, like, he's kind of whimpering and, like, saying, like, everything hurts and he, like, fades away in Tony's arms. And it works for both of them because uh, ever since, like, Iron Man 3, like, this is what Tony's been afraid of from the beginning. And so it plays really well off of both of their characters. Um, but I... I guess just speaking of Tony, like, the weird, the weird thing about this sequence is that I did find myself getting surprisingly emotional earlier in the movie when, um, it seemed like, uh, Tony was about to die. There's, there's kind of a big fake out where, uh, Thanos kind of spears him and he has, but then even afterwards he heals himself with nanotech after, uh, Strange gives Thanos the time stone. Um, all according to Keikaku. All according to Keikaku, the one out of like millions of probabilities or whatever. Uh, and I found myself getting surprisingly emotional, even though like I was last week team Iron Man is going to die. No way that Tony Stark survives this movie. But like just seeing seeing him kind of struggle uh, gets kind of got to me, just because I realized that. Um, this is a character that I've been following, that I've been a fan of for 10 years now. Like, I was in high school when uh, Iron Man 1 came out. Uh, and, so, you know, I, I'd, be, I'd been really invested in his story for a long time, and I just just really enjoyed the character. And so the fact that, like, even though walking in, I totally expected that he was going to die, like, being presented with the possibility, like, did get me emotional, which ultimately was sort of undercut when uh he ends up surviving the whole you know the death snap and then i was sort of thinking about why like if i really would have been okay with iron man dying in that sequence um because i realized that i wouldn't be because he didn't die in a he wouldn't have died in a way that made sense for where his character was leading like he wouldn't be paying a price for some mistake like he wouldn't be making a sacrifice for some greater good he would have died because peter quill fucked up the plan um and that wouldn't have been satisfying to me and so just thinking about the mechanics of it like you know who dies and why and like what purpose does it serve in the story i think that's at the heart of why i wasn't impressed with the death snap not necessarily just because i knew that they would all be coming back um i mean it didn't help but like not just because of that but it's because i didn't really feel what the story was supposed to be with that um it just felt like it just felt like shock value for its own sake to me like not really tied into something really emotional or character death like you can see like even in the, in the like calculus of who dies it becomes clear sooner rather than later that like it's just going to be the original avengers um and that's why i guess i think that spider-man's death of the snaps works better because it is rooted in character it's rooted in both the surface level um feelings of spider-man being like a teenage boy who like we see him really really retreat into being a kid in this moment and it's heartbreaking but also because that's uh that is rooted in the whole like tony spider-man relationship that has been uh built up since civil war where uh tony is serving as kind of this father figure but he's also uh kind of has this guilty conscience about like putting him in danger and sort of enabling this and so watching that tied in with his whole arc 
about uh, struggling with his PTSD, like, the whole reason he made Ultron to try and, like, keep people safe, uh, like, watching him fail, like, in that little moment, the snap was working for me, but then we go to the other characters where it's just sort of, well, this one has to die for this reason in the calculus, and this one, and this one, and this one, um, and it robs it of that sort of shock and emotional impact for me. See, I... You know, honestly, I didn't really feel anything from them all dying at the end, and I, I'm a little disappointed by that. Um, I do feel like part of it was that I was just incredibly jaded about the whole thing, and, and I do wish that I could have gotten something out of it. Like, I was really kind of just more rolling my eyes at it. Uh, and so, like, I, I'm I'm a little envious that you got even anything out of the whole death number, so yeah. to speak. Yeah, don't don't let me overstate. Like, ever, everything that I just explained was, like, for a second. Like, for a split second. And then I went right back to rolling my eyes. <laughs> Listen, that's still more than I got. <laughs> so, like, it, it, it it's disappointing to me. And, you know, I think a lot of that was just how jaded I was about it. And I think that it, it really negatively impacted the ending of the movie. And I wonder if just not knowing everything I knew about the Marvel Universe, especially the Marvel shooting schedule. Like, I know that there's a second Spider-Man coming out next year. I know that Guardians 3's due at some point. It's a trilogy. And, like, it really kind of just ended with me feeling really jaded about that stuff. But I think that uh, Birth Movie's Death had an absolutely fantastic article just kind of about, like, should that matter? And, like... I, I really I feel like I, in the end I kind of agreed with it and that it, there's just a cynical element to my opinion on it just because I know so much about the current industry and how they're working with it. Like this m- moment I guarantee was really effective for a lot of people and like I know it was because I was in the theater when it happened. So I, I as much as I want to say, oh, you know, it's a brilliant marketing strategy. You know, everyone's going to go on Twitter and talk about it. Everyone's going to go say, oh, go watch this movie. Every- it was wild. It blew away my expectations type of thing. But I-, I feel like that's probably the better way to go about it, even though it probably was a marketing strategy and whatnot. Like, it- it's 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 a ballsy move no matter how you look at it, because it could easily backfire just as much. I just am a little upset that they're all clearly going to come back, and I know that. And and so I guess, I guess this is just what I'm talking about and why I spent so much time focusing on Spider-Man. I guess it's just what I'm talking about with um, the idea of this being like a complete episode, because I'm ve- I'm very much of the opinion now that a sequel of a, of a work cannot retroactively ruin that work. It can't really because none of it's real and like the emotional experience you have with like, you know, Thor Ragnarok is a good example. Like in the canon, yes, like this ruins Thor Ragnarok's role in the canon, but it doesn't ruin Thor Ragnarok as a work of art unto itself. It, it still like has all those themes. And so that's sort of where that's sort of where I think the argument for trying to look at it as a whole, uh, as as a singular object rather than as a whole, sort of lies. And I think that um, I I I agree in that. Like I I am envious of the people who just felt the like oh no like that was really like wild and crazy and I'm sad. Um, but I think the fact that uh, it's not just for me the outgoing whole like knowing the production schedule because again for for a moment despite knowing that there was going to be a spider-man 2 spider-man homecoming 2 whatever the hell they're going to call it um you know for a moment i was sad that spider-man was dying and um to me that just proves that they had the opportunity to make this sort of act of mass hero genocide really really mean something even if they all are going to come back um and i mean hell i I guess i guess i'm going to use anime as an example again because there's another there's another series infamous for like death being sort of cheap and that's dragon ball um but when i watch 
the Saiyan saga from Dragon Ball, like that first chunk of the anime, I'm not so much focused on the fact that all these characters are going to come back. Um, I'm focused on the moments... I'm focused on on the moment that's happening, the brutality, the fear that the other characters are feeling, because that's the main thing it's going to convey. And so, in that moment, the fact that they all come back, like, several times, doesn't ultimately matter to making it a standalone work, at least to me. And so, for me, I feel the same way about Infinity War. Like, what was the purpose of killing off half the heroes? Uh... I, and as far as, like, theme, like, narrative, I couldn't really find a solid through line to track. And it just, uh, that's why the most damning thing I can say about it is that it just felt like shock value to me. Uh, that they knew it would make people sad, so they did it. And then they can just bring them back. <laughs> so, I think, just kind of a couple of thoughts to, I guess, probably wrap this up. We're already at an hour and probably going to go for another 15 minutes minimum. Um, but... I don't. I think that this movie, with that shock value in hand, would have been interesting because I don't necessarily know that had the movie just kind of ended there, like this was the end of the cinematic universe or something like that, with Thanos looking out with his regret and concern. I think it would have been a really interesting ending, and I think had we focused more on Thanos and whatnot, you know, kind of a the villain wins type of ending would have been really interesting. Maybe not in a Marvel movie because that feels wildly out of place but i think it could have made for a very interesting movie that said i think that the fact that they chose to wipe out the new the new guard is really an odd choice and i think that i'm going to go back on my original statement of like it makes sense for them to wipe out the old guard and have the new guard save them because the old guard doesn't have any movies slated for the future release like you could have killed off some non-essential guardians and had like quill and rocket and groot or something like that be the next guardian movie or something like that and even at that Not as many people know the shooting schedule as they know what's coming out. Like, I could tell you that Bucky Barnes has, like, three more movies he's contractually obligated to do. But Uh, the general audience is... that's just the worst thing? Yeah. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) But, like, the general audience isn't going to know that. They're just going to know that Spider-Man has another movie coming out. So, like, had they switched who, quote-unquote, died there, I think it would have been way more effective. Because we don't know that they have movies. And so... I'm I'm of two minds on this uh, this idea that we are setting it back to zero to give the original Avengers one last hurrah, and you know I can get behind that as a concept. I can get behind the idea of Avengers four focusing mostly on the original crew uh, because I like the original crew. And, um, I mean that, like, now in hindsight, it would be difficult to make a film like that with just how crowded the universe had gotten and how many, like, Avengers have come and gone and, like, the lineup. Um, so, the fact that they're sort of, like, setting the slate for them to have one more movie, um, makes, makes sense to me uh in both like commercially and creatively like i like I, I can see wanting to play around with those toys one last time before like you know you have to start renewing contracts or uh you know you don't want to pay this person or just you want to move on you know because they're as far as uh like the diversity angle like they want to push for more diversity and like all the old avengers like save for black widow or just like white dudes um so like so like i get uh, I get that impulse, but I guess did it was it worth it to have um, to have the ending of this movie be really cheapened by the incredible obviousness of removing Black Panther from the equation and how like for me like I think that's the moment where even casual moviegoers were like oh okay they're all gonna be back. Like, I know a lot of people who don't keep up with the schedule who are like, oh, yeah, of course. Um, So, I guess the question is, like, 
would there have been like I, I mean I, i'm sure there would have been a way but like w- what would have been a better way um to sort of reconcile that desire for avengers 4 like you know back to the basics and also like keeping your ending uh make keeping the ending like artistically and narratively sound in this one um and i mean i guess like if that's the angle that we're going with i don't I don't really know what what else they could have done, just because you could have you could say that well we can make Avengers four, not about Thanos, but Thanos is also like who we've been building to since Avengers one, so it feels sort of weird to not have them involved. I mean, I, there's there's just this great big like calculus to this thing, and um, well, you know what we could do? What could we do? If our listeners have any ideas or suggestions, they should really tweet at us. Let us know what they think. Yeah, they, they absolutely should because I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm curious. Just because I'm, I'm in, I'm in two places on this. Uh, Killing Black Panther and Spider Man, you know, completely makes me roll my eyes at the at the ending. Um, but also, I'm not against the idea of having Avengers Four be about the original team. So. Yeah, I don't know. I guess uh, I guess I'm curious to see what the viewers think on this one or the listeners. They don't really watch a podcast. <laughs> no, I mean, I guess we do technically have a YouTube channel that you could be watching this on, but I, I know what the statistics on that are, and it is not great. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, we 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 can we can be doing more with that potentially, but that's you know that's whatever. <laughs> um, but yeah, so if you guys like do have a theory or like here's a better idea or here's why you're all fucking wrong and it's the greatest movie ever made and Thanos is an incel and here's why, um, tweet at us at b a d h underscore cast. Let us know. You know, your thoughts, your theories. Um, if you want to get at one of us more particularly, like, wow, Sean, I'm really impressed by how right you are. Here's a little bit of a round of applause. Uh, you can tweet me at Sean underscore McKinda on Twitter. Uh, you can also find my website, isortof.com. I do some stuff around there. There's some weird stuff on there. You can go check it out. Uh, it's also a direct link to everything else I do, which uh, mainly is my Twitch streaming. Um, I do that. A lot. So if you want to go check that out, that's uh, twitch.tv slash helpless underscore Skippy. And if you want to tweet at me and tell me what a stupid lame brain I am for thinking that only Iron Man would die because that would be the obvious choice, uh, you can tweet that at me at Jackson J. Keller uh, and also see my other spicy Avengers hot takes that we didn't really talk much about uh, because, you know, we had to talk about, like, themes and shit. Ugh. And be sure to let them know that anime should be illegal. Um, <laughs> as always, <laughs> we'd like to thank uh, Lords of the Highway for the use of our theme song. It is Suicide Alternate Take off the album High Octane Low Expectations. They're an awesome band. Go hunt them down there on Spotify, all that good stuff. Um, thanks to 25 Years Later Site.com. They are still hosting us for whatever reason. We're a bunch of weirdos. Uh, Go check out their site. They're really cool. They've got a bunch of really great TV movie reviews just kind of discussing a lot of variety of things, mainly David Lynch films right now, but, you know, they've got a lot of stuff coming up ahead that's really cool. Um, what the fuck are we talking about next week? Do we have a thing for next I week? Don't, I don't think we decided. I think this was our end point, so let's do that. <laughs> All right. Um, next week, we're going to talk about The Iron Giant. So tune in for that. Should be a great time. Be on the edge of your seat since the Beating a Dead Horse Cinematic Universe next episode. Bye.